again, welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Laura Chamberlain and I am the Assistant Director for the Wizard and Executive Office. And I work for Manimet and Manimet is one of the organizations hosting this event along with Environment Canada and several other organizations that you'll meet along the way as we go on this journey with uh, Rufus the Red Knot. Uh, again, just as a reminder, we have some translation instructions here on the screen. We also will be sharing a link to a web page with the same instructions. So if you're having a little trouble, feel free to use those. But I can tell you, tell you now the, the best thing to do is to go down to the bottom of your screen, click on interpretation. It'll, it should be next to the Q&A, as you can see here in this diagram and click on that and choose the language of your choice. So we have English, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. And stay in that channel the whole time and you should hear as simultaneously as someone is speaking in English, you will hear one of our fantastic translators translating into Spanish or Portuguese or French. Uh, and there is a little bit of a delay and sometimes a few things get missed, but uh, the presenters, we do our best to speak slowly uh, so that the translators can keep up with us. So, uh, and this is all an opportunity for us to show how wide uh, the ranges of people who are supporting Red Knots and are caring about Red Knots across the Americas. So I will stop here and pass over to Benoit and he will introduce himself and get us started on this journey. Awesome, thank you, Laura. Welcome everybody. Welcome to this event, A Year in the Life of a Red Nut. We host this event today as part of World Shorebird Day. It's a, an international celebration and we take the opportunity to raise awareness about conservation concerns that shorebirds face we invite people to get out there and collect data on these amazing travelers. And we also try to connect people together. And that's what we're gonna try to achieve tonight. As you can see, we have people from all around the place. If you don't know what shorebirds are, they're small to medium wading birds that live near water. So that means that you're gonna find them near wetlands, along coastlines, beaches, and mud flats. Many species are long distance migrants. So they will cross boundaries, get to different countries, but it also means that they spend uh, time in very different places, very far apart, depending on where they're breeding or non-breeding. This characteristic of shorebirds means that they rely on a couple of key sites along the way. Many of these sites we'll be visiting tonight. Partners across the Americas are working on identifying and conserving these sites and nominate them as part as a shorebird uh, network of shorebird reserves. We call that the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network, or WISERN for short. I am Benoit Liberté. I work for the Canadian Wildlife Service as a biologist. And my organization has the mandate to conserve and protect migratory birds in Canada, but also those that travel outside Canada. I do want to take a minute to acknowledge that many of us are connecting tonight from lands that used to belong or still belong to indigenous people. And I think we can still learn a lot from indigenous people from around the world, especially how to live in harmony nature. Today we'll be taking a look at the migration of the red knot. This species travels approximately 30,000 kilometers from the Canadian Arctic to the southern tip of Chile. And it's a species of great conservation concern uh, because of its rapid decline. The red knot has caught scientists' interest and people's imagination around the world. And we, will, we are going to hear from people along this extraordinary 
uh, trip. To do this, we will follow Rufus the Red Knot, uh, as presented through a, a comic book. And to read the, this comic book, I would like to introduce Ted Chesky from Nature Canada as our storyteller tonight. And like all Red Knots, Rufus's journey is going to start in the Arctic tundra. So that's where we meet him as he begins his journey. Ted? Thank you, Benoit. Somewhere on Southampton Island in northern Hudson's Bay, it's June. It's about 64 degrees latitude north of the equator. There's a red knot on its nest. Crack! She feels something happening underneath her. And shortly after, two eggs open and two little birds come out. Honey, come and see the cutest chicks in Nunavut. Wonderful! Parents are very happy. Now, shortly after they hatch, they start walking. And they go down towards the water. Now you have to feed to grow up, one of the parents says. Look at all those delicious worms and bugs right here. Some time passes. Late July arrived. Look how you're tall now. It's time for us to go south. Mummy's leaving today. All oh, the little red knots look a little bit confused. They can't even fly. Mommy leaves. Later, father leaves. Eat up all those good bugs. You need it to grow up and be able to fly. The small little knots look confused again. They're being left by their parents. What's going on? And in the background, in the background hovering is a dangerous long-tailed Jaeger. It's thinking, mmm, delicious baby birds. Many days later, only one was left. His name is Rufus. Rufus was very smart and he made a calendar. And he checked it and noticed it's almost mid-August. He's starting to feel very unsettled and excited. Hurry up, it's time to fly away. His migration urge took over. Ready? Go! And he launched himself into the air. Of course, he'd done some practice flights before that, but this was the, one of the big ones. And he flew all the way from Southampton Island in northern Hudson's Bay. None of it, all the way down to the southern coast of James Bay, the territory of the Moose Cree First Nation, where he lands with a lot of other birds. Wow, there's so many friends here. Look at all those friends. <laughs> some of them look like me, some of them don't, but they all seem pretty friendly. Then somebody looks up, sees a dangerous shape in the air. They know instinctively it's danger. What is that? Falcon. And all the shorebirds take to the air, thousands of them. They form a large evasive cloud, moving as one. This is the way they can escape the falcon. They fly, some fly all the way across James Bay to get away. And they land in the territory near Boatswain Bay in Wiskaganish. Oof, the temporary threat is gone. I hope that he's gone far, far away, says Rufus. Mmm, clams, favorite food, yum. Meanwhile, off in the distance, there's some humans. They've got big telescopes. They're watching the birds. Someone from Wiskaganish says, look, some red knots. Someone else in the part of the team says, see any flags? 
Rufus doesn't notice that people are watching them. But he notices antenna and a leg flag of his friend. Meanwhile, up on the hill, there's Gary installing a modus antenna. He's telling his partner that when a bird with a transmitter is nearby, it's detected by the receiver here, the receiver in the modus antenna. All right, so we are arriving to our first site tonight, James Bay. And uh, I guess I should mention that there are six uh, subspecies of red nut. And Rufus is of the Rufa population. So the subspecies are distinguished by their breeding and non-breeding grounds, but also their migration route. The Rufa subspecies is considered endangered in Canada, threatened in the United States, and it is of, of conservation concern across various countries in the Americas. Their population is estimated at 40 to 45,000 birds, but it's been declining greatly since the 1980s. The decline is ex estimated at 70 to 80%. And last year alone, we got very dire news from one, one of the sites, and we fear that there's been another major decline uh, even more recently. So now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, so we will, I'd like to invite John Turner from the Moose Cree Nation to, um, to take the stage and talk to us a little bit about um, his part of the world. Good evening. Good evening. I'm speaking to you from Moose Cree First Nation, which is located on an island in the Moose River, Moose Factory Island, approximately 15 kilometers from James Bay. So we're located right at the very bottom of James Bay. The coast of James Bay has always been and continues to be important to Moose Cree for traditional activities such as harvesting, transportation, traveling, uh, hunting for waterfowl in the spring and the fall migrations. The harvesting of uh, geese has always been an important uh, activity uh, and it continues to be and there's uh, preserved or frozen for later use. In recent years, Moose Cree has been working with outside um, NGOs, non-government organizations on a project called Protecting Palaisiskau. Palaisiskau means uh, so a place with plenty of birds in the Cree language. Our intention is to protect the coast of James Bay from industrial development. We recognize that the the coast is an important staging area for migration of shorebirds, such as the red knot. At the same time, the coast of James is important to Moose Creek for cultural reasons. So we understand that a healthy and clean environment is important also for the cultural survival of Moose Creek people. The community is currently working on a land use plan for the Moose Cree homelands, including the shoreline of James Bay, which extends, the Moose Cree homelands extends from uh, approximately from the border of Quebec to approximately 90 kilometers north of Moose Factory along the coast of James Bay. So the community will be asked as part of this process to support the creation of a new protected area for shorebirds as part of the land use planning process. Many Moose Creek people feel that it is our responsibility as the original stewards of our homelands to protect the land that has been handed down to us from our forefathers. And it seems that in this instance, the, the, the interests of the community, uh, the wishes to protect our homelands are also in line with the interest of uh, outside NGOs that wish to protect certain uh, areas for shorebirds habitat. And it seems that uh, our interests are uh, in line and we're uh, able to work together on it. And I think there is a video that shows uh, the area that I've been talking about.
Um, but before we leave Canada anyway, uh, we'll move to another site that has and plays a similar role as James Bay. It's the Migan Archipelago. So both of these sites are important for red knot, but especially for juvenile red knot. It's one of the first places where they'll stop and gather their first reserve for their first uh, migration. And so there we will meet uh, Yves Aubry, a biologist at the Canadian Wildlife Service, who has been working on this species for uh, many years. And I believe ha Eve had prepared also a, a short video for us to present uh, the Mingan Archipelago. So I don't want to put you on the spot, Eve, but while you're here, can you give us a, a brief update of what's been happening at Mingan lately? Well, this year, can you hear me properly? Yes. Okay. Uh, this year we have been uh, working on in Mangan since the mid-July and this is a very bad year for shorebird this year. Usually we have good numbers of uh, birds showing up uh, from July, mid-July until the end of October, mid-November. Uh, but this year we had very, very few birds. This is, this is the first, the, the worst year since two, 2006. So we don't know what's happening with the adults. The females uh, probably skipped the uh, manga if they were any, and males also. And we had only a few adults mixed with juveniles in the third part of August. But uh, we're hoping to to see more juveniles coming in. So we hope that that is only a situation where uh, the adults skip. The, uh, just flew over Mega or took another route this year. We don't know yet what's happening exactly, but uh, really base out there. There's a team that is working and monitoring red nuts in collaboration with Parks Canada, and uh, we're gonna work and put some transmitter on juveniles and try to understand their movement, as you will see in the uh, in the video. Bonjour, ici Yves Aubry qui vous souhaite la bienvenue à la réserve de parc national de l'archipel de Mingan. The western islands of the archipelago are made up of limestone formations that have been eroded since the last ice age to create magnificent natural monuments. There are also vast tidal flats of limestone where a rich and diverse marine life has developed. These characteristics make the islands a very attractive stopover for birds, especially shorebirds, which are abundant in migration. More than 20 species are regularly observed. The marine organism that shorebirds feed on when the tide uncovers them are abundant and vary according to the environment. That it is amphipodes in the seaweed, gasteropods on the limestone flats, or beds of tiny mussels in shallow waters. Since 2006, we have been monitoring all species of shorebirds during the post-breeding migration and noted a general decline in the species observed. We pay particular attention to the red knot and collaborate in a network of researchers and biologists from both Americas to understand the significant decline of the species since the 1980s. In order to document the health of the species and its population, individuals are captured. They are transferred in keeping cages and are manipulated by a team of competent collaborators who take notes measure them and mark them. A coded flag makes it possible to identify the individual at a distance without having to recapture it. The color of the flag indicates the country where it was tagged. Any sightings of birds with such marks contribute to identify among others the migration routes and to estimate the survival rate of the species. In recent years, different technologies are used to track them. Some birds 
wear small tags transmitting precise position via satellite, while others may wear a tiny tag transmitting signals picked up by the MOTUS network, made up of hundreds of antennas scattered over the two Americas. The Mega Archipelago is privileged because it hosts many young wren nuts that are beginning their first migration south. These birds represent the potential for the recovery of the species. A study is underway to determine the areas and habitats they visit during their first two to three years of their lives before they return to the Arctic for their first nesting. This information will allow us to better target conservation efforts. The archipelago also represents an important resting site at high tide. The birds concentrate on emerging rocks far from the shore to avoid predation. Most of the wren nuts that pass through the mega archipelago fly to South America and even to Tierra del Fuego. It is hoped that the efforts invested in the mega archipelago by Parks Canada and Environment and Climate Change Canada will contribute to the recovery of the species. Yes, as uh, Eve was saying, by the time the early fall, late summer rolls around, the red knots are ready to migrate, and Rufus certainly was. With his trusty calendar nearby, he checked it, and it was mid-September, and it's time to leave. So off over the ocean goes Rufus and his compatriots flying farther and farther, day, night, day, night. Suddenly, they spot land, South America. After flying for nearly a week, and they land on this great beach and wetland that's called the uh, Reentrancias Maranhenses. It's a very special area along the northern coast of Brazil, which is a Western Hemisphere shorebird reserve network site. Like Benoit was talking about. Very smart to stop there. Oh, mom didn't tell me that traveling is all about feeding. Of course, you know, for shorebirds it is. So after feeding for a while, then it was flying again and again down along the coast of Brazil. Wow, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. But where's the beach? Everybody knows that Rio de Janeiro is all about beaches and samba. But the, for crowded, the beach is too crowded for me. I didn't travel this much for this. On the beach, there was a pack of feral dogs and there were all sorts of people and it wasn't a safe place for a shorebird. So they picked up, they moved a bit further. Ah, that's a much better place. Fishermen off in the distance goes, Nosa, olios, pasaros. All right. So as red nut leave North America, they undergo one of the longest stretch of their migration without the opportunity to stop and refuel. But once they reach the, the coast of Brazil, they find plenty of food. And that's very important because as you'll see, red nut life is pretty much all about feeding. They store fat uh, as reserve to undertake these long migrations. As Ted was mentioning, they can go for uh, up to six or seven days nonstop. And, um, and, uh, and yeah, and so just to give you a comparison, the, the, the reserves that they store is the equivalent of about 60 gram, which is as big of, as a chocolate bar. So imagine if you were to undertake such a long trip with so little reserve. Once you get to the next place, uh, you really need to find a healthy habitat where you can feed. And that's exactly what the Northern coast of Brazil offers red nuts. Um, 
And it's a, it's a rich uh, area with lots of invertebrates and crabs and still healthy mudflats and mangroves where they, they can feed and most importantly, refuel. So somewhere, some red nuts will choose to stay in Brazil, but others will continue their journey. So we will now follow Rufus as he joins other red nuts that travel even further down to uh, South America. Yeah, the stay on the beach was very short. We never have time to stay for long. They cannot, because Rufus has to join other birds from all of the Americas at Tierra del Fuego, at the southernmost point of Chile. It's like a big party. Kind of cold, though. Rufus is awestruck. He sees somebody he recognizes. Uh, I don't want to bother you, but are you? Moonbird, that's me. Moonbird is a famous and very old red knot. He's flown in his life the equivalent of the distance to the moon and nearly back over well more than well over 20 years of migration from the Canadian Arctic to Tierra del Fuego. For Rufus's eyes, Moonbird is the best, biggest superhero of all. But Moonbird is very humble. Maybe that's why he survives so well. I'm not a hero, just a simple flying knot. Yes, so although Moonbird is very humble in the comic book, uh, he's really helped to raise the profile for conservation of red knots. And um, like Ted was saying, he's, uh, he's one of the oldest red knots uh, that we know of. He was bended in 1995, recited multiple times over the years. And the last time was in 2014, which would make him 21 years old. And so now we will join Carmen Espos from the Centro Bayalomas. Uh, Carmen works in an area where uh, Rufus and probably Moonbird used to hang out. And so, Carmen, I'll let you introduce uh, to us Bayalomas. Good evening, this place. It is in the southernmost tip of America, the South America, in the big island of uh, Tierra del Fuego, Chile, one step away from Antarctica. And uh, here at Bahia Lomas, at uh, the end of September, every year, big number of uh, Arctic, uh, was, uh, Arctic uh, red knots, as we call them. And what's important about it? There's a concentration of over, of over 50% of the population uh, going to South America. And in January, we counted 12,200 red knots in the bay. To tell you that and uh, to give you, to show you this video, so that you can see what we do. I hope uh, you like it. Bahía Lomas es un humedal marino costero ubicado en el estrecho de Magallanes que posee características únicas. Cuenta con extensas planicies mareales y zonas inundables salinas que reciben influencia del Océano Atlántico. Se trata de 69 kilómetros de costa que se constituyen en una de las zonas de mayor importancia para aves playeras migratorias en el hemisferio sur. Por ejemplo, para el playero ártico, eh, que viaja cerca de 15.000 kilómetros desde el Ártico canadiense hasta Bahía Lomas, solo para alimentarse. Es una especie bastante importante que está en peligro en la mayoría de los países donde pasa. Para otras especies, como el zarapito de pico recto, es el segundo lugar en importancia en América del Sur. Y hay otras especies que no migran tanto como esas, pero que solo se encuentran ahí y se concentran 
en densidades, por ejemplo, de 14.000, 15.000 individuos, como es el pilpil en Austral. Hace 17 años, el Centro Bahía Lomas de la Universidad Santo Tomás, con la colaboración de instituciones públicas y privadas, ONGs locales y otros centros de investigación, vienen desarrollando acciones de conservación en tres ejes estratégicos, investigación científica, educación ambiental y, de manera más incipiente, turismo de intereses especiales. En esta línea, además, la universidad suscribió un convenio con la East China Normal University, que tiene como objetivo la colaboración científica. Nos hicimos cargo de todo lo que tenía que ver con estudios ecológicos en relación a ver qué era lo que comían estas aves cuando llegaban y cómo estas presas han ido variando en el tiempo. Ese fue como nuestro foco cuando llegamos. Y en la medida que hemos ido estableciendo alianzas e incorporando a otros grupos, estamos trabajando principalmente en lo que es el censo de aves playeras, que se hace anualmente y que nos da la medida de cómo se están comportando las poblaciones. Y también tenemos estudios de anillamiento, captura de aves para ver los tracks o los caminos que hacen en estos viajes de larga distancia. El estudio en torno al playero ártico se hace en conjunto con 14 países por los que circula esta ave migratoria, lo que permite tener un panorama más completo sobre su trayectoria. El objetivo central de estos estudios es generar las bases científicas para que las decisiones que se tomen en torno a este sitio se hagan de manera responsable. Y el trabajo ha tenido frutos, pues a mediados de abril de 2020, Bahía Lomas fue designado como un santuario de la naturaleza, convirtiéndose en el santuario más austral de Chile. Una noticia que en el centro reciben con alegría y que también abre nuevos desafíos. Tenemos como principal objetivo conformar un comité de manejo que va a ser un grupo de actores claves que vamos a conservar el lugar en, en el tiempo. Y el segundo tiene que ver con poner en marcha la administración y, y lograr actualizar el plan de manejo que tiene el sitio. De esta forma, el Centro Bahía Lomas mantiene su compromiso y trabajo en la conservación de este sitio, pensando tanto en el presente como también en el futuro. Ed, you're muted. Voila. After a, after a, a, a cold summer, austral summer in Bahia Lomas, um, it was time for Rufus to check his calendar. Now, there weren't a lot of trees to hang the calendar on, but he found one. And he realized it's time to start migrating. Gotta leave with my friends already February. So off he went, this time his compass pointing towards the north, and Rufus is on the move again, stopping on the coast of southern Brazil in another wizard site called Lago do Peixe. Oh, it's good to be back on sunny beaches. So as we've seen, it's very important to understand uh, also the health of the food that the red nuts are, are eating. And I guess I should mention that to accomplish the long distances that, that these birds do, um, it requires very specific adaptations. So every time red nuts will arrive and leave a site, uh, there's important physiological changes that go on. So for example, when they arrive, Uh, the organs that are linked to feeding, like the stomach, the intestine, the gizzard, will all increase in size and they really become feeding machines. And a couple of days before they need to start their migration, these organs will decrease in size and it's the flight muscles that will increase to allow them to travel, uh, to make, to make the, the flight to the new destination. Um, and so as we are making our way Uh, northward now, 
I would like to invite Roberta Rodriguez from Save Brazil to present us Lagoa do Peixe. Can you hear me? Yes. I could hear you for a brief uh, second. I could hear the translator. Uh, my, na my name is Roberta. I am a biologist. We are working as uh, for the journey the Rufus flies. Uh, we work with the conservation. The program of beach birds is working intensely since 2015 to strengthen this area, the national park, Lagoa do Peixe. is addressed to conservation of the migra migratory birds, these species of birds in collaboration uh, with, uh, uh, with Besser. And we have uh, promoted the migratory birds and we seek to assess the ecosystems to understand how different uh, parts of society and the cities near the national park, how they perceive, how they understand the importance of conservation of these species, the closeness to the local community has brought, has, has meant lessons regarding the pathway we have to undergo to protect birds and people alike. You will listen to one of the persons that lives in, close to the national park that learn about conservation of these species. It is fascinating to understand that birds, same as uh, Calidris canutus, uh, relate in different ways uh, depending on the communities. Um, um, we have to understand that we are all responsible about migration and are responsible for conservation in different sides of the planet. Now we will see the video. My name.
as we heard Rufus say, it's good to be back on the sunny beaches near Lago de Pesce. But he found himself with a group of red knots. And they were all getting very restless. There was a lot of chatter. Time's going by so quickly. Enough feeding. Time to go home. Somebody says, Rufus looks great with those red feathers. Hmm. Rufus says, hi, a little bit embarrassed. Lots to pack for our 7,000 kilometer nonstop flight to Delaware Bay. Awesome. They're ready. Off they go, flying nonstop for a week until they hit the eastern coast of the United States. A lot of them land at Delaware Bay and the beach, including Rufus. I'm starving again. Felt like this several times, so he knows what the routine is. He's here to feed. Wow, so many birds. He's not alone. Look at those horseshoe crabs. Let's search for eggs. It's good having adults around who knew this. And they struck gold. All the horseshoe crabs have laid millions and millions of eggs. All of a sudden, just as they're eating and getting their fat res reserves back, pow! A net, a cannon net flies over top of them. Ouch! That's my leg. You put your wing in my eye. Is this the end? The knots are desperate. But warm hands start removing them from the net. Easy bird. No one is going to hurt you. And they go through the process that Eve described earlier. All of the ones receive bands, flags. They're weighed, they're measured. Some of them get transmitters. And Rufus, Rufus is thinking, hey, I have bands just like Moonbird. Rufus imagines, imagines himself as a superhero like Moonbird. So, although Rufus uh, stopped in Delaware Bay in the comic book, there are other sites along the eastern coast of the United States that play a similar, similar role as Delaware Bay. So we wanted to put another one of these places in the spotlight tonight. And so we will talk about uh, Georgia Barrier Islands. So I will invite Abby Sterling, who is the director for the Georgia Bite at Manamet, to talk to us about this site. Great. Thank you so much. I am just so excited to be here with everybody. This is a really fun opportunity to hear from so many international friends who are working on red knots. Um, I work for Manamet as the director of the Georgia Bite Shorebird Conservation Initiative. Um, and as uh, Benoit said, Delaware Bay is very well known, but the southeastern United States is also very important for red knots. And we have new research coming from partners that shows that indeed red knots are getting enough fuel here in the, the Georgia Bight in the southeastern part of the U.S. to make it all the way up to the Arctic. So it's really um, exciting. The Georgia Bight is critical for red knots and other shorebirds. We have three wizard sites in our region, including the Georgia Barrier Islands, which we're going to talk about um, tonight. We have over 400,000 birds that use this area every year, including some years we have about a third of the population of the Rufa red knots. There are a lot of partners, federal, state, local partners, landowners, and nonprofit agencies that we work with to increase awareness and build capacity to recognize and protect the unparalleled habitats that this region has that supports so many shorebirds like Rufus the Red Knot. So tonight, we're going to hear from one of those partners, Fletcher Smith, who works with Georgia 
Department of Natural Resources, who's doing research on red knots and see a little bit of the sites of the Georgia Barrier Islands where Rufus may have uh, stopped by or flown over on this uh, incredible journey. The Georgia Bight is a geographic region on the southeastern Atlantic coast of the United States. Um, it stretches broadly from Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, down to Cape Canaveral in Florida. And the main area that we're talking about today is the part of the coastline of Georgia and South Carolina. The Georgia Barrier Islands were designated as a Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network landscape of hemispheric importance, a stretch of coastline of about 100 miles comprising uh, nearly 14 barrier islands. The Georgia Barrier Islands are made up of protected islands, vast salt marshes, bright green spartina, and shell reefs, inlets, sandbars, and mud flats. Along the Georgia Barrier Islands, many partners and collaborators work hard to protect the food resources and the places that red knots and other migratory shorebirds need to feed. Here, Fletcher Smith of Georgia Department of Natural Resources is looking at what the red knots are eating on this mud flat. We'll catch up with him to learn more. One of the more interesting uh, things that we've we've documented through reset, but we're seeing a, a fair amount of movement within the coast in any one year. So the birds may arrive, say at, at Tybee Island, and they're focused on uh, donax uh, clams to to you know to feed on initially, but then the horseshoe crab spawn happens at at St. Catherine's Bar or or Ogeechee Bar. All the birds are moving to that to that food resource. So we're seeing in some years a bird will be feeding on, you know, up maybe up to seven or eight different islands that the southeast is a terminal staging area, meaning that the red knots are putting on enough fat here in the southeast to fly directly to uh, Arctic breeding grounds. Long distance um, uh, red knots, the ones that are wintering in uh, Tierra de Fuego. Uh, they're arriving typically uh, first week of May uh, is when we start seeing known uh, long distance migrants. We can tell that because they've been tagged uh, in Tierra de Fuego, so they'll have orange flags or, or red flags. But the earliest we typically see those birds arrive is, is first week of May. And uh, in, in some years we have what what seems like a, a large number of those long distance migrants and and they're staying for a little while the bigger threats to to red knots in the georgia bite are there there's a a, a pretty significant horseshoe crab harvest uh, that's that's taking place and uh seemingly uh, we, we witnessed a a site uh, that that just a few years ago was was really good for for red knots and and horseshoe crabs that seemingly in the past two years has has petered out into nothing. Other factors I think that are impacting uh, red knots in the southeast are the the places that red knots want to stop. Typically, are those same places that people want to hang out, uh, and the boaters will come out and uh, and and disturb of those. Uh, it could put all the birds off of the critical food resource. So, so Rufus has bands now, and he feels like a superhuman, super, super bird, super not. So he's ready to go and take in the last leg of, of his flight nonstop to the Arctic. Here I come. 
Paz is New York City. Paz is over James Bay, where he landed on his way south just to start his trip. Sometimes red knots will stop there, but a lot of them will continue. And he's one of those that continues all the way to Southampton Island, northern Hudson's Bay, Nunavut. And he reflects, what a long trip. But it really was all about eating, wasn't it? Thank you. Thank you, Ted. And so I guess as we complete the cycle, Rufus and the other red nuts are back in the Canadian Arctic. They go up there to breed because the predator pressure is lower. And there's also abundant uh, food source for their chicks when they hatch in the middle of the, the summer. And um, as you've seen, there is a lot of concern about the decrease of red nuts. There's a lot of people who are monitoring the species, monitoring their food sources and their habitat. And it really is together that I think we are going to be able to make a difference. I want to remind people that all of the sites that we visited tonight are either part of the Shorebird Reserve Network or candidate sites, as we see a last uh, movie of a, of a breeding uh, red knot. And so identifying these sites is obviously critical and making sure that they're conserved as well. Um, so although there's still a lot of challenges ahead, I think we're in a time now where it is more urgent than ever before. And there's probably better international cooperation as well as new technology and concerted research effort that really allow us to track the birds, understand where they go and understand where the issues are. So obviously the reserve network is one tool, um, but I also want to mention that we all have a responsibility to protect the environment and make sure that red nuts have a safe place to come back to every year uh, because we're all responsible for hosting red nuts at one moment or the other uh, during their life cycles. And so there's obviously small things that people can do. Um, so, you know, respecting nature and making sure you clean up, uh, especially picking up plastic is one obvious thing. Um, sharing the beaches and keeping your dogs on leash, as we see, as we've seen, disturbance can be a, a pretty big issue in some areas for, for shorebirds. Make sure you visit these extraordinary places that we mentioned tonight, as soon as we're able to travel again and support the local organizations that are taking care of these areas. Um, if there are teachers listening, or if you know teachers that would be interested in hearing about Rufus in their classrooms, please reach out. We would be happy to share his story with them and also sign up to social media uh, with one of the uh, co-organizers of tonight's event. So I do want to thank all the partners and especially Manamet and Laura and Danielle and V for setting up this, uh, this amazing event. I know it required a lot of coordination and I'm, I'm very uh, happy and uh, surprised that we, we pulled it off. I think it, it's, been, it's been great. So I really hope that people um, enjoyed the event tonight. And now I, I guess we will open the uh, question a session with uh, with all the the panelists and the speakers. Thanks, Benoit, and um, just also to thank the the authors and the artists, uh, Ted, Ariel, and Martin, uh, who created this comic and is available in uh, English, Spanish, Portuguese, French, and Dutch, which are um, five of the main languages, and I believe it's also available in Cree. Uh, so thank you to you all for sharing that with us and allowing us to share that with uh, everyone else. So I am going to see if we have any questions coming in here. Just bear with me just a moment. So Abby, I have a question here for you. Can, are you, they still harvesting horseshoe crabs for medical research? Does COVID-19 affect this harvest? 
Yeah. Um, there is still harvest in in South Carolina for biomedical research um, where horseshoe crabs are harvested and blood is drawn and that's used to make um, a compound that helps test the sterility of any kind of medical equipment. And so that is happening here in the Southeast and it's also happening in other places along the East Coast as well. Um, and I saw a follow-up question about um, what conservationists are, are working on to try to, to to do um, to address those threats to that important food resource for Arctic nesting shorebirds and the whole coastal ecology. And there is a great deal of effort underway to try to um, raise awareness and to, to put pressure um, on the uh, pharmaceutical industry. Um, there's a synthetic alternative that can be um, used instead of uh, that compound derived from horseshoe crab blood. And so that's a really promising path forward um, to, to try to um, get that switch to happen so that horseshoe crabs aren't needed um, to, for you know, vaccines and for medical equipment and everything like that. Thanks, Abby. And that is one of the most important issue, one of the most important threats and issues that, that many partners are working on uh, throughout the Atlantic coast. Another question we have, and I'll, I'll kind of, I'll leave this open to any of our biologists here, Carmen, Eve, Abby, uh, are red knots migrating these long distances because of food scarcity? No takers. <laughs> um, we can talk well, a little I, bit. Of, oh, you want to go, Laura? Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> I didn't want to jump in twice, but um, I'll just mention a couple of things that we see in Georgia specifically, and then maybe other folks from other sites can chime in. Um, you know, one of the things that we see is some of those long distance migrants are only here for a short time, but we have um, some more short distance migrating red knots as well that might stay here for the entire winter. They may be just down in Florida and we'll see them. And so often we see those birds um, utilizing different food resources, like the um, little surf clams that, that are often on our beaches. And then later in the season when horseshoe crabs start spawning as spring warms the water up and um, the spawn starts, then they'll switch to horseshoe crab eggs. And about that time, we start to see an influx of more of the long distance migrants too. So there's a lot of different strategies and some of that research with looking at banded birds helps um, reveal some of those really interesting stories um, in Georgia. Carmen or Eve, do you have anything to add? Yes, to add the these birds have flown uh, this route millions of years, probably. It was not such a long distance in the past. And now we wonder, and this is the question we all raise, why do they migrate 15,000 kilometers a year to feed? It's a question that we all try to answer. So, well, it's a good question and I think in, we are all working on this. All right, and I'll just, while I pull up our next question, I'll say that uh, Ted, our, our storyteller tonight, has offered to share copies of the, of the book to, if, for anybody that would like to have that via email. So what we'll do is we'll have a follow-up email to you all and uh, in that, we'll have a little, uh, you know, uh, form to fill out so that you can let us know uh, that you're interested and fill that form out and we'll get that to you via email. All right. Uh, Eve, uh, how can I, we have a question here. How can I assist with red knot field research, banding and tracking in South America? Eve, would you like to take that? Yes, I was trying to to uh, write down an answer, but uh, I couldn't write it down. I don't know why, um, but I'll do it live. Um, 
the first thing is uh, if you see a bird wearing a tag and you can identify the uh, the color of the tag and uh, the letters and or the codes you can report it to the bendedbird.org this is what i would I'd like to write down <laughs> and uh, this is the first thing um, and also in some sites sometimes you can uh, uh, participate as a volunteer and by contacting uh, some research group and which are probably known by Laura or you can contact it, it, it all depend of where you are because I don't anonymous attendees so I don't know where you are uh, in South America okay uh, if you are in Argentina uh, well, you can contact uh, is it Natalia Cursi in the Buenos Aires area or Patricia Gonzalez when you are in uh, San Antonio Oeste. Uh, or you can talk to a Manumet the coordinator for South America. Uh, I don't recall his name. Uh, Laura, can you mention that his name? Uh, uh, Arnie, Lesterhouse. Is, uh, Arnie Lesterhouse. Arnie Lesterhouse coordinates ISS, an International Shorebird Survey in South America. And uh, Roberta also assists with some of that uh, from, from Brazil, for Save Brazil. So they're and starting, if, you, if anyone here is, is in Northern Brazil, they're, they're starting up some intense monitoring there. And if you are in Chile, Carmen could be a good contact or she knows lots of people as well. So even if you are not from Chile, Carmen know all the, let's say the uh, diaspora of the red nut in, uh, in South America, so. Yeah, so we'll um, we'll include Arnie's information because he's he can be your first stop, and then he can get you to the right person. Um, uh, let's see. I had a question, and then I got distracted. Uh, are you seeing that climate change is impacting the red knots? Ben, why would you well, like to uh, take this one, or or Eve? Go ahead, Eve. Yeah, sorry. Uh, well, in the Arctic, uh, it's right now the, the most important impact would be direct impact will be probably most likely in the Arctic, where you will see happening some uh, synchrony problems. So that means that the, the birds are used to fly at a certain period of time, and then they arrive in the Arctic, and there they, they have to, to eat something, and when the, uh, the young hatch, Normally, it's coinciding, it's uh, matching, it's fitting with the uh, emergence of uh, flies and other invertebrates so the young can feed on. And if the, uh, there's a shift in that, and so the insects are emerging uh, later or earlier, that means that when the young are hatching, the food is not there. It's like the same thing with the horseshoe crab. And uh, if there's a mismatch, uh, uh, there's a the, the horseshoe crab don't spawn uh, when the red nuts are in, in southern or in southern uh, latitude, like along the east coast of uh, Atlantic in the United States. Well, then the, the bird don't don't acquire all the resources and uh, accumulate fat, enough enough fat for the migration and for the reproduction. So there's a there's a will be the most important effect. Direct effect will be the. A kind of mismatch between the synchrony of uh, hatching and feeding and the food resources. Either in in migration in May and uh, and as well and on the breeding grounds. Yeah. And also the higher impact of uh, the uh, more frequent and um, the hurricane period that will be longer and the more hurricanes that will disturb the migration flight of those birds and may be detrimental at some point. Yeah, I was just going to add on this, like there's probably potential impact of climate change that vary on the, the various locations, but hurricanes, uh, we know that red nuts are able to fly, you know, um, around hurricanes, but as these storms increases in, in increasing frequency uh, and, and, and intensity, there's a chance that at some point, you know, it, it starts creating some, some issues because they don't really have a lot of options uh, when they're flying over the ocean. I mean, they can stop in the Caribbean islands, but um, if they're not in the right, you know, physiological state to start feeding again and completing their migration, there, there could be potential uh, issues. Um, so these are, 
uh, still uh, hypothetical, but um, it seems like, yeah, there's definitely going to be some major impact of climate change at various places um, and various stages of their uh, migration. Ted, do you want to? Yeah, I was just going to add, there's, there are things that we can control much more easily, such as disturbance along beaches and protection of, of uh, key stopover sites. So um, although I, you know, everybody needs to fight climate change, obviously um, there's, there, that doesn't mean there's other, other things that add up. And I think, you know, we've, we've come up with a pretty good list of them um, and everyone has a way of contributing to uh, mitigating those, those issues. All right, so Eve, um, we're gonna put you on on this on the spot again. Um, and you were mentioning this earlier when you were giving us a brief update of how things are going this year with the juvenile numbers that you're seeing. So we have a question here. Uh, is the decline more related to decline of number of juveniles hatched surviving or to the mortality during migration? Uh, at this point, we know that the survival of juveniles is much, much lower than adults. And what we don't know is where is the most important area where the mortality occur. So we don't know if it's between the breeding and the first stop, like in James Bay or Manga Island, or it's on their first long flight to Northern South America or the Caribbean uh, coastal areas. And, um, and that's why we are studying, marking juveniles more. Uh, we have been, one of the main target of Manga Project is to understand what's happening with the juveniles. And, but we have little success uh, in the, so far with technology because it's very recent that we can have a very small uh, transmitter and um, we had no luck last year. We know that we have a bird in Venezuela that has been there for uh, since uh, last December. It's still there, it was still there last week. Um, normally it seems to be still alive. Um, also, um, this, this is something we would like to answer, to understand in the next few years. Um, but also we know that juveniles are spending their first two years of life in at southern latitude and sometime it could be up to three years so this is something which is not really clear for us so at this point we know that the survival is very low and does it uh, does the survival cover the mortality of adult or can is it bringing the species is it not supporting the species enough for uh, recovery this is something we'll uh, we'll try to understand in the next few years. So I cannot say more for now. But the survival, I think we have something like 20%, if it's not less than that, the survival uh, from the data we have from Mega for the juveniles. So we've had a couple of questions about uh, folks that are looking for how to get involved where they are, looking to understand um, red knots where they are. Uh, and so uh, again, we'll put um, Arnie Lester House's uh, information in the follow-up email. So if you're interested in learning how to become a volunteer, uh, he can help you as well as Lisa Shibley who coordinates a North American um, monitoring surveys. And uh, we have um, a question here, which is an interesting one. Do you partner with wildlife rehabilitation centers who may be able to inform some of your research? Uh, and I, 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 will, I don't know if, it's, if that's a partnership for, um, that's occurring with the scientists, but I do know that in conservation, whenever there is an oil spill, which does happen, uh, that the wildlife rehabilitation centers are really important for that effort. Um, and we are always, we are looking to them to help us uh, mitigate those issues. Um, and I know where Carmen is in Bahia Lomas, as well as Northern Brazil, uh, where we saw today that many red knots are going, that is a, is a very regular concern, uh, oil spills. 
Uh, let's see. We have a question here. Um, has there been more extensive diet studies conducted in other significant stopover locations along the migration path? Uh, so we know a lot about what they're eating when they're on the Atlantic coast, uh, eating horseshoe crabs and horseshoe crab eggs, as well as donax. But what about in other locations? So. Um, Maybe Carmen, have you? Do you have anything to share on that about what they're eating when they're uh, in Tierra Fuego? In Bahia Loma, they consume a small clams, Darina solenoides, not donex, and they feed on other bivalves, mitilus. Those are the main three in the case of Bayaloma. Great, thanks. Thanks, Carmen. And I've also seen a couple of questions. I've also seen a couple of questions um, that have been, some of them have been answered, um, but if you're not, if you haven't seen all of the answers uh, regarding horseshoe crab uh, and the adoption of the synthetic lysate and horseshoe crab harvesting, and Abby has put a link in the chat that's a really great link to find out more, and you can sign up with them with horseshoecrabrecovery.org to be receiving all the most recent updates on what kind of efforts are going on and where you might be able to have your voice heard. So definitely check that out if you are interested in uh, being a part of that. Um, and I know I saw some other questions, I'm guessing Abby probably answered them, but I'll, I'll answer out loud as well, that there are red knots in Florida as well. We don't currently have any wizard sites in Florida, but there are important sites for red knots there. Uh, and there are also horseshoe crabs in Florida and as well as other uh, great food for, for red knots. And uh, like many, most of the other Atlantic coast beaches from Canada to Terra de Fuego, they are, um, the beaches in Florida are popular with people at the same time as they're popular with birds. So there's always the concern of, is there enough space for the birds to, to feed and rest? So we have another question here. Do you feel U.S. Fish and Wildlife is doing enough in its role to conserve red knots in North America? And what is happening with critical habitat designations? So the roof of red knot in the U.S. is listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. And it has been going through an extensive process to uh, create a recovery plan and uh, species assessment. And right now, open the comment period is open until September 13th, I believe. Abby, thank you. Let's put the link in the, in the chat. Um, and so October 13th to September 13th, just a few days from now, sorry. Um, there's only a few days left to comment on that critical habitat designation. And if you can uh, take a look at that and make sure that the places that you know that are important for red knots are included there. Uh, and then going forward from that, um, we hope to have that finalized as well as all aspects of the recovery plan to be finalized. Uh, and I, I do know that many of our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service partners are working really hard to make sure that there is funds that are available to support restoration and other conservation efforts. They're also supporting efforts throughout the Americas, especially in South America, where there may not be as many funding opportunities to support conservation. So there is a lot of work that's that's going into red knot conservation. 
Uh, a lot of partners, many, many more than you see here. This is just a small, small sample of the partners. Maybe Eve can give us an estimate of how many partners he thinks Red Knots have. <laughs> But there's a lot and everyone, it's, it's, a, it's quite a challenge to uh, recover a species that has declined by 80% um, and is facing an upward battle uh, against climate change and human encroachment. Uh, but there are many that are working on this and working hard. Um, any other questions coming in? You want in Spanish, B, would you be able to share that? Shall, shall I read it in English, Laura? Oh, uh, yeah, if you could read that in English. Okay. Have you observed any behavior in which migration is considered, uh, in migration that is considered unusual, be it because of lack of food or something related to that? Any behavior? during the migration that is considered unusual. Have you noted that? Because of lack of food or something yep. related. Yeah, I, I see Carmen is typing an answer, but if Carmen, if you wanna um, share that we, I'd like to hear what you, what you think about that. And one thing I, I can share, um, not necessarily about uh, lack of food or change in behavior, but but Benoit mentioned a couple times that we have seen, uh, we saw a very sharp decline in the number of red knots that came through the Delaware Bay this past May, uh, as compared to previous years. And there's not a lot of understanding of why that happened. Uh, and we have been doing monitoring to, in South America, to understand better where that overwintering might be happening, if it's happening, or if there are places that have uh, sudden catastrophic events that may be uh, harming many red knots all at once, or if there's a loss of a food source. So there's a lot of research going into understanding where did these red knots go um, and what happened. Uh, and so some of that can get into what, you know, what is their behavior? Why, why would they stay in South America instead of continue forward to, on their migration each year? Because that does happen. Um, all right, well, I think the questions are slowing down. Um, and I really appreciate everyone having such thoughtful questions here. And we will make sure that we send out as much follow-up information as we can. Uh, you can follow uh, any of these organizations that have been here with us today. Um, Manamet, Nature Canada, the News Creek First Nation, Bahia Lomas, Save Brazil. Uh, Georgia Wildlife Research Resources, uh, Quebec Ozu, and the Mingan Natural National Park Reserve, and of course Environment and Climate Change Canada, to continue to, to learn more about what is happening with red knots as well as other shorebirds. We do work on uh, all the shorebirds of the Americas uh, to make sure that we are protecting habitat across the entire hemisphere. So please follow us on, on Facebook and we will send out those additional resources and links for getting involved where you are. Laura, can I add one thing? Sure. Sure, I just wanted to sort of reflect back on what John Turner said earlier about uh, the most Cree's efforts to protect their coastline with for them for their culture for the because the area that the red knot stops at is also important for the survival of the moose cree i think that's probably the case in many other areas um, where people depend on that habitat and i know right now indigenous-led conservation is a very important way into the future so we're thinking of our different things we can do that's just another thing i think we all can and should support 
Absolutely, completely agree. All right. Well, thank you all so much. And the recordings will be available on YouTube in each of the four languages. And we will have um, uh, available, uh, not immediately, but within the next few months, we'll have some curricula that will go with these, these recordings so that they can continue to be used in classrooms uh, over the coming year. All right, well, thank you all so much. I, we appreciate you joining us this evening and uh, get out and see some shorebirds. Oh, and happy World Shorebirds Day. That's why we're doing this, it's World Shorebirds Day. <laughs> and we forgot to, to have our, our party hats on, but I think we all are, are always celebrating that. That's great, G good connection, Laura. <laughs> Thanks everybody, thanks for uh, participating. Thanks to all the panelists again. Really appreciate your participation today and um, hope to see you soon. <laughs>